<laughs> so why don't we go and let me first introduce myself. My name is Adam Bell, I teach in the government department and I'm part of the Strauss Center. So it's my pleasure today to introduce the, another installment of the Broadway Speaker Series. I want to talk a little for a second about Ron. I met Ron 10 years ago. He's a Harrington Fellow at the University of Texas in the government department. And that's where I first met him. So when the chance came up to bring him here, I jumped at it. And I'm going to turn it over to Richard Christian, who's part of the Roman series. He's got back from his research in Bangladesh. And she's going to do the interview. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm a 50 year assistant here at the LBJ School. And I'm And it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ron <coughs> He's currently the Beverly and Richard Fink Professor in the Department of Political Science at the Liberal Arts College at the University of Minnesota. And his latest book, Narrative and the Making of U.S. National Security, was awarded multiple best book awards uh, from the American Political Science Association, including the Jervis Schrader and the Sartorio Awards. Um, today's talk is actually based on the forthcoming article in the National Interest and builds on his recent work uh, looking at narratives and the extent to which this has placed growing constraints on the office of the president in shaping and making foreign policy decisions and strategy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John uh, Kemp back to UT. Thank you, Nisha, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to the Strauss Center for hosting me. Thanks for Pat for making that, making all this possible. And it's so good to be back here after a decade. It was a wonderful year that I spent uh, here at LBJ, and, well, not really LBJ, the government department, but spent a fair amount of time in LBJ. But I'm very grateful to UT because the book that uh, Nisha alluded to, Narrative in the Making of U.S. National Security, which I'll, part of today's talk will engage with, that book actually has its origins in an article that I wrote here at uh, UT that I thought in fact was going to be a one-off piece and actually and ended up becoming my focus for a very long time. The, the cautionary tale in all that though is that I was actually told that I could write a book very quickly based on that article. Uh, it then proceeded to take me eight years. <laughs> very I'm not sure if that's a statement about me or a statement about the nature of writing books. Um, it's hard to start a talk like this without talking about what's transpired over the last week. The first week of the Trump presidency has been as eventful as anyone could imagine that it would be. A flurry of executive orders and presidential memoranda whose meaning is still unclear, whose legality is still being determined. And many of those, of course, had nothing or little to do with foreign policy per se. They were about health care and government regulation. Um, uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline, though that affects me in Minnesota. Uh, and those relating to foreign affairs, many of them right, had nothing really, had very little practical import, like scrapping the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was already a dead letter at that point. Some of them in foreign affairs were long, typical, and widely expected of any Republican president, right? like eliminating, blocking the use of US government funds to fund foreign NGOs that perform or promote abortions. Um, other have had little content so far, and we're mostly about projecting an image of strength, right? The review of military readiness that President Trump has authorized, defeating ISIS, right? But last Wednesday, uh, pre uh, President Trump seemed. All right, this keeps going. Sorry, AT and T. Does anybody get this AT and T Wi-Fi thing from no longer disrupting? Is anybody? It's constantly coming up. Turning it on. I keep clicking no. Okay. You can turn off the wi I guess I could turn off. Oh, hold on one second. That's a good point. I'll just turn off my own Wi-Fi. <laughs> That'll solve that problem. All right. Good. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, thank you. <laughs> How about thinking outside the box? Uh, last Wednesday, President Trump signed an executive order that seemed to make good or to begin to make good on his promise of building that big, beautiful wall with Mexico. Uh, although he doesn't have funding for it. Um, and he made much more significance, because it is more within the realm of possibility, seems to make good on that promise of beginning to deport uh, lots and lots of illegal immigrants, and perhaps to punish local jurisdictions, including St. Paul, Minnesota, that tried to stand in his way. And then on Friday, well, we hardly need to review what happened last Friday, because I don't think anybody's been able to talk about anything else since it happened on Friday. And given all of this, it might seem a very strange time to give a talk entitled Pity 
the president why we can't have leadership in foreign policy. After all, hasn't Donald Trump, hasn't he projected his will, or at least his id, onto the establishment? Um, true. But I would contend that President Trump, he will continue to act. But if his aspiration, as he has told us, is to change things for a long, long time, that's a quote, then any changes he pursues will not endure unless he learns how to lead. Now the article from which this talk derives, as Nisha mentioned, is coming out in a few weeks in the national interest. I originally pitched this idea in October, when most of us thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. And immediately on November 9th, I received an email from the editor asking me, do you, s I had not yet submitted the article, and he said, do you still stand by your thesis? Does this change anything? And I have to admit, I was thrown for a loop, like many of us, uh, and certainly contrary to my expectations. Um, but I reflected, and I thought not. And I still will hold that, because I'm not going to say that we should necessarily pity this president, as the ti talk's title suggests, but I do remain convinced that the domestic politics of foreign policy have in recent years, in the last 20 years, have become much, much harder for presidents to manage, and foreign policy leadership has become nearly impossible, and that's when presidents are even interested in leading, and it's not at all clear to me that President Trump has any interest in leading in that way, which I'll come to at the very end. Domestic leadership of foreign affairs has always been fraught and frustrating, but two central tasks, setting the agenda or fixing the narrative, and building and maintaining a supportive coalition have become much more difficult as audiences have become increasingly diverse and fragmented, and as politicians refrain from horse trading for fear of WikiLeaks-style revelations. Trump, the presidential candidate, reveled in the politics of division. American politics, of course, had become highly polarized well before Donald Trump came on the scene as a serious presidential candidate. But Donald Trump carved and mined new seams in the American body politic. But Trump, the president, cannot govern through division alone. But even if Donald Trump were suddenly tomorrow to embrace the politics of unity, he would discover that a durable coalition today is an almost impossible dream. Presidents have every incentive today, as I'll argue over the next half hour, to refrain from sweeping narratives, to provide very targeted side payments, and to craft narrow coalitions to support policy initiatives. Barack Obama's modest ambitions in foreign affairs his instrumental rhetoric and his pragmatic inclinations reflected his domestic circumstances as much as they did either the world or his personality. Donald Trump may be, shall we say, a singular figure in background and in temperament in the presidency. But in this regard, I think he will be no exception. Now, I don't want to spend the next 30 minutes talking about Donald Trump. Frankly, I feel like I've been doing nothing else for weeks. Um, and so instead, I'd like to put Mr. Trump aside much as it will pain him not to be the focus of discussion, uh, and return to him only episodically over the next 30 minutes or so. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what I mean by foreign policy leadership right, and these central tasks of foreign policy leadership as I see them. Second, I want to talk about these three ways in which leadership's become so much harder, about a fragmented authority, diverse transnational audiences, and the implications of information and communications technologies. And I'm going to talk a little bit about presidential leadership in foreign affairs since the Cold War. That is, in what ways have the, has this manifested? Because the American public's desire for leadership has in no way, I think, diminished. But there's been continual frustration with presidential leadership. So I'll spend a little time talking about Obama in particular in this regard, because I think he is if not an exemplar in the sense of someone to one should admire, he is an exemplar in the sense that he really epitomizes <laughs> these sorts of dynamics. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit at the end, because I have to, about Trumpian leadership and what that might mean. Um, there's no question, right? We, we've known for a long time that presidents have a much freer hand in foreign policy than they do in domestic policy. This is partly due to presidential powers, Right, as commander-in-chief of the military, sitting atop a very large federal bureaucracy, including the Foreign Service and the intel intelligence community. It's partly because Congress's formal powers in this regard are quite limited, and Congress's informal powers have been even more limited, as Congress has largely abdicated what little responsibility it has. So presidents have substantial latitude for action from a domestic perspective, 
in international politics, by law, by tradition, by inclination, and it isn't accidental, right? As presidents headed, as Barack Obama headed in the last two years of his presidency, headed sort of around the bend, right? The focus became much more on foreign affairs than on domestic. It wasn't going to get anything done with Congress, certainly. But presidents <coughs> typically need to cultivate broader political support, even in the medium run. Because on the one hand, they, for many important initiatives, will need funding, right? which only Congress, of course, can provide. It does have power of the purse. But they also need at least the acquiescence of the mass public, or otherwise they can scare off international partners. And sometimes they need the public's more active support. But beyond that, presidents often aspire to have a more lasting impact. They don't want to see their signature achievements go up in smoke as soon as the next president comes into office. And this is a real danger, as Donald Trump has made very clear in just his first week in office, as he's not only swiftly reversed certain aspects of Barack Obama's foreign policy, but has also begun to roll back long-standing traditions. Enduring foreign policy rests on leadership. And as I mentioned, that involves two central tasks. One is fixing the narrative, or kind of a deep form of agenda setting. And the other involves forging and maintaining a coalition. So let me talk a little bit about that first task, which is really the heart of this book on narrative and the making of US national security. And to grasp what this means and why it's so important, let's think back a bit about the, foreign pol about the debates over the last 15 years. The state of US foreign policy debate since 2001. Now the phrase war on terror uh, has its, uh, had its ups and downs and became the subject of satire as reflected on the screen. Uh, even during the Bush administration, Many officials tried to excise it as an offending phrase, right? So we had alternatives that did stick, like the long war, which was less an alternative than a compliment. But we also had things that quite didn't roll off the tongue, like the, violent str the global struggle against violent extremism. And even the military came to see the war on terror as an impediment in U.S. counterterrorism. The Obama administration comes in, immediately excises the offending phrase itself, but underpinning the war on terror was a deeper narrative, one might say. Right? A deeper narrative that survived the slogan's decline. And in line with what the theorist Kenneth Burke has called a dramatic pentad, that narrative depicted the actors, their purposes, the action, and the scene or setting of a global drama. It told the story right, regarding who was the target of the attacks on 9-11, why was America targeted, who's the adversary, and what is his nature, uh, how great is the threat, how central problem is terror in the world? The answer, the dominant narrative for the next decade would tell us is tremendous, huge, President Trump might say. Um, and what transpired on 9-11 was a moment of historical rupture. Right? So this is uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft famously says right after the attacks that today everything has changed. The terror narrative, as I understand it, constituted a post-9-11 public rhetorical code or script to which speakers had to adhere if they wanted to be taken seriously and not cast as beyond the pale. Not everyone who reproduced this terror narrative, not everyone who legitimated their foreign policy stance in its terms, believed in it, or at least they need not have. But public rhetoric demanded their adherence to it. And this dominant narrative underlay both the war on terror, that militarized war on terror paradigm, as well as its chief alternative, which was the law enforcement paradigm, right? The, the chief competitor, excuse me, the chief alternative. And the law enforcement paradigm and the militarized paradigm, although they differed, they were still occupying that same terrain. The centrality of the war on terror in U.S. foreign policy. 9-11 does a moment of historical rupture. Why is, are certain things transpire on 9-11? Whether Al-Qaeda constituted soldiers or criminals, and what transpired on 9-11 was an act of war or an act of or a crime, in both cases they were rooted in this deeper narrative. And a narrative in the making of U.S. national security, right, so, um, oops, not what I meant to have happen. A narrative in the making of U.S. national security, I show how that dominant terror narrative then crucially tilted the political playing field with respect to the Iraq war and played a key role in silencing leading Democrats who might otherwise have wished to have more vocally opposed that venture. It, its dominance underpinned policies ranging from extraordinary rendition to Guantanamo to signature <laughs> drone strikes to the at home the creation of a massive surveillance infrastructure in the face of little opposition. And though its dominance has today waned, it has left a deep impression on the politics of foreign policy. 
and it's still with us, right? The, it is the signature legitimation strategy of the Trump administration's <coughs> foreign policy, as best we can tell, and arguably, if not frankly, even more significantly, a substantial part of its domestic politics, too. Why narrative? Moving away from the politics of the war on terror, because narrative is this, it's, so, it's through narrative that human beings order an experience that is otherwise inherently disordered, that they impart meaning to themselves and to their world. The impulse to narrative, scholars tell us, is universal across humankind and across human history. Narratives, it turns out, shape how people group ideas. They're more likely to remember them if they come in a narrative or storytelling form. And it also affects what solutions they find most attractive. Narrative is sometimes counterposed to reason, but I don't think this has it right. Narrative, in fact, doesn't stand opposed to reason, but it rather makes rational decision-making possible. Because those narratives are stories about what it is that self and other, um, what it, who it is that self and other are, that is about identity, and what it is that self and other want, that is about interest. And without identity and interest, we can't begin to have a discussion about rational decision-making. This is, of course, an abstruse scholarly insight, but it isn't just an abstruse scholarly insight. David Brooks wrote a number of years ago in the New York Times, one of his columns, that unlike other animals, people do have a drive to see coherence and meaning. We have a need to tell ourselves stories that explain it all, and we use these stories to supply the metaphysics, without which life seems pointless and empty. Narratives of national security are a peculiar kind of public narrative, and that's what I'm interested in. And they ask questions about who are the agents of global politics? Who are those key actors? Um, it asks about their purposes. What moves them and motivates them? Um, what's the nature of the relations and the interactions between chief global actors? It asks about act, or some have called agency. What is it that the key actors have done that's consistent with that understanding of their character? And scene. How divisible or indivisible <coughs> is global security? Does global security rather constitute a seamless whole? And if we alter any one of these pillars, we end up with a different kind of narrative. And narratives, as some would have it, would simply eliminate, narratives themselves lead ineluctably to policy choice. I don't think this is quite right. Uh, it's a very strange view of politics that doesn't see contestation as being at the heart of politics. Contestation is the lifeblood of politics. But contestation is never unstructured. Some premises always go unquestioned. They may strike us as common sense, but they are always the product of human agency. In other words, debates over national security are often underpinned by dominant narratives that weave present challenges, past failures and triumphs and potential futures into a coherent tale with well-defined characters and plot lines. Right? Things like the Cold War consensus that allegedly drove US foreign policy for decades during the Cold War. The terror narrative through which all of us have lived. I'm talking today about the United States, as I do in the book, but this is not an exclusively American phenomenon. Think about the civilizing mission of liberal empire, or the Nazi obsession with living space, the gaullist vision of restoring French grandeur, the Iranian revolutionary regime's great and little Satans, the communist faith in capitalist aggression and imperialism, Israeli's conviction for some time now that they have, as they would put it, no partner for peace. These are shorthand expressions encapsulating rich narratives that are for portraits of the protagonists, scene, and action of global drama. And that at least for a time, constituted the nearly unquestioned basis for political debate in their respective nations. Making policy stances that could not be justified in their terms, socially unsustainable, and thus casting them beyond the boundaries of legitimacy. And that is how I think dominant narratives work, by shaping what I would call the boundaries of legitimation. They limit what political actors can publicly justify, <coughs> and therefore what policies they may pursue. They are the terrain on which politicians, pundits, and activists argue over policy. So this is a kind of a deep form of agenda setting, and not surprisingly then, politicians expend, substan expend substantial <coughs> resources trying to ship th shape these background narratives that in turn define the boundaries of legitimate policy. Fixing the narrative is at least half the battle. And it is here, I argue in the book, the presidents have really been able to shine in principle, thanks to the unusual position of the president in American political institutions and American political culture. They have bequeathed to the president unparalleled legitimacy 
and endowed them with special authority, especially on national security. As Woodrow Wilson long ago observed, there is but one national voice in the country, and that is the voice of the president. And while it turns out that pres the bully pulpit isn't quite all that, and it's very hard to shape public opinion on any particular policy proposal, that is in fact consistent with this view. That is, Americans have not looked to the president to tell them what to think about specific policy proposals, but rather they've looked to the president to make sense of developments at home and abroad, to render meaningful a world that sometimes seems disconcertingly chaotic and meaningless. <coughs> at the end of his first term, in a moment of reflective self-criticism, Barack Obama recognized this, though I'm not sure he did much about it over the next four years. He said, the presidency is not just about getting the policy right, but equally about telling a story to the American people that gives them a sense of unity and purpose and optimism, especially during tough times. The nation's narrator-in-chief resi resides in the Oval Office. So presidents have unique opportunities to fix the narrative and shape the terrain of subsequent argumentation. That doesn't mean they do it easily, and it doesn't mean they do it smoothly. They can squander that authority, they can choose to remain silent, they can miss out on opportunities. And they still need to speak in the right way and at the right time. And that's the focus of part one of the book, right, where I look to this conjuncture of who speaks, how they speak, and when they speak. Uh, and I'm going to do this really fast, so because I want to get to second form of leadership. But just to give you a flavor, right, it affects um, when one speaks, right, we have these unsettled moments, settled moments, excuse me, when there is a dominant narrative. And when there is a dominant narrative, those who give voice to alternatives are rudely received. Mainstream media and other elites either ignore them or treat them as beyond the bounds of respectability. But there are also unsettled times when multiple narratives of national security legitimately swirl about the public sphere. And the debates over na national security are comparatively unstructured. But narrative chaos is not the no normal state of affairs. Most people crave a much more orderly environment that facilitates the unreflective action of everyday life. And they often prefer any answer to no answer. They experience narrative disorder as disorienting and disconcerting. And they yearn for what some have called ontological security, or security of the self. And so they are, at those moments, particularly attentive to authoritative speakers, like presidents, who can help restore narrative order. But the presidents also need to speak at those moments in the right way. The psychologist Jerome Bruner has usefully distinguished between argument and storytelling. Arguments are different. Arguments presume, or at least pretend, that the interlocutors <coughs> and the audience share certain understandings. And then the interlocutors seek to fit their argumentative brief to those shared understandings. Storytelling, as the primary way which human beings impart order to an inherently messy reality, is less about fitting than it is about fixing, about fixing a foundation for argumentation. Storytelling seeks not to make a case for specific policies, but to make sense of an audience's world. And by identifying the protagonists, by defining the exchange among them, by depicting the scene and organizing events into a causal sequence, successful storytelling imparts meaning so that events no longer seem random. So the argument is that presidents, when they rely heavily on storytelling rhetoric during unsettled narrative situations, they have the capacity to shift politics from the unsettled into the settled zone. That is, I've been talking about that low, this lower right square right, of unsettled situations and storytelling with the capacity to move things from the unsettled into the settled, where what I've elsewhere called rhetorical coercion becomes possible. That is, provide de depriving others of the socially sustainable arguments with which to oppose. And sometimes, of course, speakers can get themselves caught up uh, in devices, devices and vices, I should say, of their own making. Franklin Roosevelt plays a key role after Pearl Harbor in defining the adversary of the Second World War. In marked contrast to the First World War, Roosevelt says, the adversary is not the German people, but rather the militarists, the fascists, the Nazi regime. Three years, there's lots of speculation about why Roosevelt does this, nobody really knows. Within three years, Roosevelt, for again, for reasons we don't really know, in fact, opts for a very different view. And at the Second Quebec Conference in 1944, he tries to lay out a vision for the fate of post-war Germany that is, in fact, uh, deeply punishing even goes beyond what his Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, would like to see put in place. Roosevelt finds his hands tied by the dominant narrative regarding the nature of the conflict and the nature of the adversary that he has helped establish at the beginning of the Second World War. 
For a variety of reasons, presidents don't always seize those opportunities. Sometimes, like Roosevelt, they miss opportunities as the non-interventionist, dominant non-interventionist narrative is collapsing. Roosevelt shies away from challenging it directly, engages in argumentative rhetoric rather than storytelling I show, and allows non-intervention to persist well beyond, as a legitimate alternative, well beyond what one might think, even though he goes to tremendous lengths to try to tar it with, sort of, uh, with being sort of in the Nazi's pocket and so on. And similarly, Ronald Reagan, adopting storytelling during settled times, right, and attempting to narrate the Nicaraguan conflict, in both cases, they end up in a situation of stalemate. That was a lot to try to process. Um, <laughs> what I rather want you to come away with is an understanding of the ways in which presidents were once upon a time able to fix narratives and able to lead under particular circumstances. The second major task of foreign policy leadership is about building and sustaining a coalition which allows the government to mobilize resources and public opinion. Now we have lots and lots of po uh, findings in US politics that especially when it comes to foreign affairs, publics are ignorant and inattentive. And yet they are rational, seem to be rational in the aggregate. And the reason for that is they follow the cues of trusted elites. Which means that leadership in domestic politics is less about speaking to the mass public and much more about managing fellow elites, marshalling elite support, and limiting open opposition. And they have three basic ways of doing so. One, of course, is coercion, threatening punishment to compel adherence. I'm here at the LBJ school, got to talk about <laughs> coercion. He's pretty good at that. Second, bargaining, he was pretty good at that too, right? Which is offering side payments or limited concessions to secure policy <laughs> compliance. But the third, and this has been recently highlighted by With the study of LBJ, by um, uh, Elizabeth Saunders, is about manipulating information. The ways in which elites manage information flows to co-opt and declaw elites. And presidents used to be pretty good at all this too. Because all three methods of coalition building used to be a lot easier. It's easier when presidents, first of all, could excel at that first task of leadership that is narrowing the scope of debate via dominant narratives. It was easier when politics was less polarized, which renders those across the aisle more susceptible to coercion and more open to bargaining. It was easier when elites came from less diverse backgrounds, which may admittedly have made politics less democratic, but commu made communication easier and bargaining smoother. And finally, as I'm going to argue in the next few minutes, it was easier when there was, frankly, less transparency, which makes it a whole lot easier to engage in horse trading. So what has changed in recent years? Well, uh, the first thing that's changed is the erosion of structures of authority. The historian Daniel Rogers has, I think, aptly calls ours an age of fracture. Since the 1960s, traditional claims to authority have held less sway. The producers of culture are multiplying and diversifying. The bonds of national community have been wearing away. And this has been reinforced by an ever-expanding array of entertainment and news made possible first by cable television, but then accelerated and expanded by the internet. And as the Princeton political scientist Marcus Pryor has shown, the effect of this is that the disinterested revel in their ignorance and the news junkies feed their passion more richly than ever, sometimes in ideological and partisan echo chambers. And the explosion of fake news during the most recent election cycle, it seems to me, combined with the unprecedented attacks by the Trump campaign on the credibility of the mainstream media and now by the Trump White House, um, during and after the election are all part of the same process. The implication, then, is that presidents cannot <coughs> lay claim to the narrative authority that they once could, even on matters of national security. The public sphere has become a chaotic marketplace of ideas in which countless speakers vie for public attention and approval. It's been a lot harder for presidents to have the national rostrum to themselves. As an example, for years, Barack Obama tried to bring some perspective to, this, to the public debate on terrorism is merely one challenge among many the United States faces, not as an existential threat. I suspect to many uh, in this room that will seem fairly obvious. But he failed, because to many Americans, in fact, that seemed to confirm that the president was either naive or duplicitous. And then for them, Trump's tough talk and his willingness to name radical Islam was a welcome change. And it resonated so powerfully that it became sort of a form of truth-telling. Either you're willing for Trump, either you're willing to say, utter the words radical Islam as the adversary, 
or you're not being serious about foreign policy. Second big change, um, the rise of the transnational. At the very moment that our social spheres have, contra have contracted, and people have arguably <laughs> descended more and more into ideological and partisan echo chambers, the audience relevant to US foreign policy has expanded. Pol um, as political organization and mobilization have increasingly taken place, not just within nations but between them, so has the demand for legitimation, that we've moved from all politics is local <coughs> to at least some substantial part of politics is transnational. And that means that leaders have to get the buy-in of diverse audiences, but this is hard and it makes legitimation harder, it means arguing for policy harder, because there are, as we audiences become more diverse, there are fewer shared rhetorical resources, fewer settled bases for legitimation that they all have in common. And so speakers then have incentives to try to draw on these different elements for legitimation to make their case in different ways to different audiences, and they are then more vulnerable to charges of hypocrisy. Obama's reset with an attempt to reset relations with Muslims around the world, beginning in Cairo in June 2009, came to seem hollow over time. Partly, of course, because of the administration's deeds, right? You're going to conduct counterterrorism by drone strike around the world. It doesn't really fly very well. But also because Obama failed to find a common language in which to legitimate those policies to extraordinarily diverse audiences at home and abroad. And the final thing has to do with the information and communications technology revolution. And one of its effects is that episodically, unevenly, government has become more transparent. Officials know that well before formal declassification, every email or text message they send could find its way into the public sphere. It's become harder for governments to keep secrets. And that's even before political appointees and bureaucrats were openly at war with each other, as they seem to be in the first week of the Trump administration. Um, in fact, you can't even say that it's leaking like a sieve. It's leaking like a sieve with no holes in the bottom. It's just a hose. <laughs> Presidents are by no means powerless in the WikiLeaks era. They can still coerce, they can still bargain, they can still manipulate information. But these techniques are less effective when politics is more polarized and, less tra and more transparent. The fear of revelations makes politicians cautious about methods of coalition management that seem at odds with the principles of democracy. Now we might generally think of transparency as a good thing. And it is all to the good if it makes unsavory methods of presidential control, like coercion and information manipulation, less available. But it also has the effect of, has a less appealing dark side, because it impedes even those crucial backroom negotiations that grease the wheels of coalitional politics and are sometimes the stuff of lasting partnerships. It makes leaders reluctant to offer side payments and concessions to stabilize elite coalitions, and it makes potential partners reluctant to engage in horse trading. Again, one might think this is a good thing if it takes <coughs> politics out of the dark back room into the bright shining light, except that excessive transparency breeds paralysis <coughs> and as it destabilizes those policy coalitions. And that is hardly what Americans want of their government. Frustration with Washington paralysis is a rich vein into which Trump so ably tapped as he claimed that he was going to finally get Washington to do something. And it, I think, begins to make sense of something, sort of one sign of these times is something that for some of us I think has been puzzling, which is why has the Obama administration so unusually and excessively declared war on leakers? Right? It's gone, and on the journalists who would publicize those leaks. Because it makes governing a hell of a lot more difficult. So presidents, of course, have had to adjust to this, right? Um, these challenges to presidential leadership have not dimmed the American public's desire for such leadership. They still want, look to the president, to explain a world marked by rapid change and diffuse power and that's seemingly resistant to coherent narration. And presidents have tried to deal with this in various ways, as I'll talk about in the next few minutes, but all have left the American people frustrated. So first we have the prudent anti-visionary, right? In the classic, if you've seen Dana Carvey do his, George H.W. Bush impression. It's just absolutely perfect. This is the picture, right? Who, despite his proclamation of a new world order, that brief moment of vision, seemed out of touch with America's standing as the last remaining superpower. And that gave way to, I will call him the extravagant promiser, that is Bill Clinton, whose administration was continually dismissed as unstrategic, as merely lurching from crisis to crisis, but in fact, if you read um, Derek Chile and Jim Goldgar's excellent book, 
folks in the Clinton administration were obsessed with finding containment successor. They wanted to have the next containment. And if they lurched, it wasn't from strategy to strategy, it was from, or crisis to crisis. It was from slogan to slogan. Their containment idée fixe led them to promise what they ultimately could not deliver. And that was that America, as it would be the indispensable nation in the construction of a peaceful post-Cold War, I would say even post-political <coughs> world. And in the end, by the way, ironically, not even the slogan would remain within their control. Because the only one that finally stuck was when a former ally, Mike Mandelbaum, applied to them in 1996, the very year that Clinton proclaimed the indispensable nation, and that was foreign policy as social work. Third, the bold decider. Right? Um, Bush got it in a way, his, at least after 9-11. That, that Manichaean post-9-11 narrative was derided by elites as simplistic, was clear and ambitious. But the real world proved less accommodating, which reminded Americans that good leadership also requires good judgment. Uh, and by his second term, rhetorically, Bush 43 was sounding a lot more like his father, Bush 41, than he was like the cowboy of Europeans' nightmares. And that gives rise, finally, to number four, which in a way, by the way, is, takes us back, not, takes us back to George H.W. Bush in our cycle, which is Obama, the, cra the cautious pragmatist. Um, Chastened by Bush's experience, Barack Obama in foreign policy erred on the side of rhetorical caution. And as he shied away from the inspiring oratory for which he was in other arenas, justifiably famous, the contrast was striking. And he may be most remembered in the end for don't do stupid stuff, or at least a saltier version. Political allies and adversaries alike have continually fretted over the last eight years over Obama's modesty in global politics that the New York Times called his now, sadly pinched view of the powers of his office and his failure to articulate a strong, overarching blueprint for the exercise of American power. Frustrated with his critics in spring 2014, in a press conference with the Philippine president, Obama gave voice to this and defended his record in a way that was, didn't quite grasp the moment. Said, Obama, he said, you hit singles, you hit doubles, every once in a while we may be able to hit a home run, but we steadily advance the interests of the American people in our partnership with folks around the world. He has this obsession with the word folks, by the way. Um, the response was, this is an attempt to be folksy, I think. The response was swift and harsh, right? Republican presidential candidates predictably made political hay of this. Um, and Maureen Dowd, as only she can do, put it best. She said, a singles hitter doesn't scare anybody. It doesn't feel like leadership. It doesn't feel like you're in command of your world. What happened to crushing it and swinging for the fences? Or even for Reed Zakaria, who was as avid a defender of Obama's foreign policy as you will find. Uh, issued similar sorts of language that I recall saying, once more with feeling, Mr. President. <laughs> Obama's critics seem to think that this cautious pragmatism, this rhetorical restraint, is entirely a reflection of his temperament or a matter of poor judgment. The solution then seems straightforward. Find a president with a different makeup, who can show some passion, swing for the fences, who will embrace and wear proudly the mantle of leadership and in this way, too, perhaps, Donald Trump has been the anti-Obama. The diagnosis is intuitive, but I think it's wrong. Because Barack Obama's cramped ambitions in foreign affairs, his modest instrumental rhetoric, his pragmatic inclinations, were more reflections of those <coughs> circumstances of a world of fragmented authority, diverse audiences, and transparent and polarized <coughs> politics, more than they were his persona. And I would suggest that they represent the future of presidential leadership in US foreign policy, probably no matter who occupies the White House. Occupant, perhaps accepted. Because when you have the decline of narrative authority, as I argue, it is quite reasonable to shrink from sweeping narratives in turn and embrace other rhetorical modes, from the instrumental rhetoric that Barack Obama favored to the belligerent exhortation that is Donald Trump's forte. And when you have a world of increasingly polarized politics, you have three options. You can try to advance a unifying narrative to override that polarization. But as a, for reasons I've suggested, that's very hard in a world of fragmented authority. You can alternatively engage in wedge politics. Well, as Trump did during the campaign, that's very good for electioneering, but very hard for governance. And finally, you can engage in pragmatism. Because pragmatism involves minimum winning coalitions of convenience, taking issues one by one on their own terms, not as part of a grand strategy. And this, I think, is why Obama told David Remnick of The New Yorker, I don't even really need George Kennan right now. That his greatest problem 
in coping with the world's challenges, he believed, he was saying, was not a flawed or absent strategy. But I think he was trying to indicate when he said that what he really needed were the right strategic partners, that what he needed, he needed to be able to build coalitions for a diverse range of initiatives that seemed to partake of no orthodoxy. It seemed that Obama was talking about strategic partners abroad, but I think he was also alluding to strategic partners at home. His former Assistant Secretary of Defense has called Obama's approach the long game, which is less a strategy than a set of vague principles, restraint, patience, precision, balance that most of us would agree with, and a kind of a checklist. But that checklist informed the Obama administration's support, uh, approach as it mobilized support for, among others, right, the pivot to Asia, the nuclear deal with Iran, aggressive counterterrorist drone strikes, military deployments to the Middle East and Central Asia, economic sanctions on Iran and Russia, arms control, limits on greenhouse gas emissions. No single coalition was going to provide stable support for so diverse a range of initiatives. But that has come at a cost, because Obama has gotten little credit for either leadership or accomplishment in foreign affairs. Now, I'm no fan of many things Obama did in foreign policy. We can talk about that. But I would nevertheless argue that some portion of the critical assessment of his foreign policy comes from a containment idée fixe, as Obama's allusion to Kennan implies. Because thanks to that containment fixation, foreign policy leadership in the United States has meant giving voice to a comprehensive worldview and an enduring strategy. Never mind that containment meant many different things over the, president, over the generations, was, was not pursued strategically in any kind of serious way. But policies appear successful only when they seem to emerge from some kind of deeper strategy. And Obama's varied array of programs falls far short of that standard, and his administration's achievements have registered as far less than the sum of their parts. And the consequence is that Obama, though a master orator, has appeared strangely inarticulate in foreign affairs, to the point that even sympathetic observers, like Tom Friedman, have gently chided the president for his foreign policy of whispering and nudging, and others, like Dan Dresner, have criticized him for letting others fill the vacuum of interpretation. Foreign policy leadership has become nearly hopeless. The president's capacity to fix meaning and set the national agenda is much diminished, uh, even in foreign affairs, and so too is his power to forge and maintain an enduring coalition. Meanwhile, the American public still looks to the president for the sort of leadership he can no longer provide, which is a recipe for disappointment and frustration. This was true for Barack Obama, and it would be true for Donald Trump as well. Foreign policy leadership need not be impossible. If we adjust our expectations to match a world of transnational mobilization, fragmented authority, and sense of transparency, if we recognize that coalitional policy now is <coughs> issues-based and fleeting, and if we acknowledge the limits of strategy and the virtues of pragmatism, until then, as I said at the start, pity the president. But I can't end quite there, because I've got to talk about Donald Trump and his foreign policy and his mode of leadership, which I think these images more or less summarize what I think. <laughs> we have so many questions about the Riddler, I mean Donald Trump, in these early days. President Trump and his advisors seem to think that one can lead by tweet and invective, by purging the bureaucracy, by seeking to stifle the media. This is the stuff of authoritarianism, not the stuff of democratic leadership. Now, if Donald Trump were a normal democratic leader, I have some faith that he would respond over time, at least, to the sort of structural incentives I've laid out. But Trump is not a normal democratic politician. Does he actually aspire to lead in this sense? Does he aspire to fix the narrative and define the terms of debate? Does he aspire to forge and sustain a coalition to support an enduring and positive program? So far, at least, the answer seems to be no. He seems to have no interest in building that coalition. He continues to engage in deeply divisive politics. He seems to want to be only a weapon of mass disruption. Now this is perhaps part and parcel of his populist persona. He was swept into office railing against the ways of Washington. He could only turn around and immediately start participating in Washington's usual games. But unless Trump learns to lead, shows an inclination to lead, he also will not be able to deliver on his promise to get things done, which he assures us he can do because he knows how to make deals. This requires compromise and working to some extent with Washington, not just against it. This is not, however, I hope this is not taken as a recipe for complacency, because the power of the presidency over foreign policy remains immense, and Donald Trump can still do an awful lot of damage, even if the kinds of things that he has in mind don't endure. Because if Trump pursues just a fraction of what he's promised or hinted at, 
among others, withdrawing from trade and environmental accords, undermining long-standing alliance relationships, embracing a revived nuclear arms race, ripping up the nuclear deal with Iran, partnering with the declining Russia, launching a trade and currency war with China, and maybe a physical war, we've learned in the last week, backing Israeli territorial expansion. He will have brought about a radical change in America's foreign policy and global posture. The next president, if I'm right, will still be able to reverse many of Donald Trump's policies if he or she likes. But he or she will not be able to reverse the past. Others will have adapted, some with glee, some with regret. And he or she will confront a world made anew in part by Donald Trump. So if Donald Trump continues along this path, don't pity this president. Pity us. Thank you. I handle my, field my own questions? All right, if I can ask folks to introduce themselves, I know a small number of you, but not everyone, but I'll start with Huge, who's been sitting here grimacing through most of the talk. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I always grimace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, uh, uh, so I'm Eugene Goss, I'm a professor at the LBJ School for those of you who don't know me. Thank you for coming. Interesting, highly entertaining talk. Um, so uh, I think the way to say this is that um, I think you are unfair to your book. Um, and uh, it's, it's not because I'm going to you know, go into details on page 227, you said yabby yabby, but um, uh, you said that it's harder now to create a narrative for the president, so we should pity the president because he can't then structure the debate. But several of your complaints about the problems presidents have recently are actually about um, their inability uh, to break out of the confines of a very powerful narrative. Like, you're, you're pitying the president because you can't have a narrative now because there are multiple audiences and, and transnational um, uh, 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 features of policymaking seems inconsistent with the fact that the 9-11 narrative is so powerful Right. Obama's problem was, as you said quite eloquently, that when he tried to deviate from the 9-11 narrative, that people told him he was either lying or naive, that they think the narrative was powerful. Um, or, to take it out of the US context, he alluded to another very powerful uh, uh, narrative in Israel, that uh, we have a new partner for peace, um, that uh, uh, seems very powerful. Or one that's more familiar to me in the US context is, if you're in favor of a restrained foreign policy and, and um, less international activism from the United States, it's very hard to break out of the existing narrative as you defined it, you know, seeing pieces uh, uh, indivisible around the world, actors, the US has a role to play, the, you know, the narrative still seems extraordinarily constrained. So why should we, you know, why should we believe that narrative is no longer as Right. <laughs> um, great question. Right. So I, I think that there's and there's sort of I think two angles to your question. One is you observe these dominant narratives still out there, right? And in fact, those dominant narratives are highly constraining. So part of it depends on how we understand narratives themselves are, are nested, right? And we some many of us I think had forgotten how much let's say realists, liberal internationalists, and neocons actually have certain varieties of, ne of realists I should say liberal internationalists and neocons actually had in common, right? And in fact, Donald Trump's emergence <laughs> has in fact reminded everybody of something that they've kind of forgotten amidst all of these internecine quarrels, that in fact they share a great deal. So I think there are certain narratives that are, that are quite, um, that have proved quite sustainable over time, right? And that even if it's harder to establish a dominant narrative of national security, there are things that are much deeper, like American exceptionalism, right? Although it should be noted that Trump has, has challenged that openly as well, right? without any seeming consequence, as far as we can tell. <coughs> Barack Obama in 2009 is asked at a press conference if he believes in American exceptionalism. And Obama, this is sort of the, sort of forgot the moment that he was in a press conference and thought he was in some university seminar room and says, well, you know, every country believes itself to be exceptional, <laughs> right? <laughs> Never said those words again. <laughs> uh, Trump had no issue with that. Right? And Trump said, which is not a completely implausible argument, which is we kind of need to get our own house in order if we want to be admirable to anybody, right? which itself kind of resonated with me, I have to say. Right? But it was, but I'm not a public figure. 
<laughs> right? So that is a, Ameri insofar as American exceptionalism constitutes the foundation, the belief that America has a special role and mission in the world, right? Very hard to break out of that deeper identity narrative. But narratives, there's two issues. One, can we still have dominant narratives? And two, where do they come from? Right? Whether in fact we still, dominant narratives I think uh, have become harder to the, um, let's take for example the terror narrative, which as you pointed out is still an important strain in US foreign policy. Right? And Donald Trump has played into. But the fact is that there is no dominant narrative in that regard any longer. That is that the Obama administration broke with some elements of the terror narrative, but not others, right? So they refashioned that narrative around 2010-11. And what they argued was they did two things that were different, that changed the pillars as I understand them. One, they argued that in fact terror was just one threat among many, right? Not that kind of overweening threat, right? Obama, by the way, gives voice to it. Everyone forgets in 2009 at the inauguration, he analogizes al-Qaeda to this threat with, to the Soviet Union at his inaugural, but by 2011 he's broken with that. And the second thing that, he, that they break from is who's the adversary? Not terror and not terrorists, but Al-Qaeda and like-minded affiliates. A narrower conception of the adversary. Right, so you have a breaking, now, but there's been no agreement ever since then in that regard. Right, so Trump is playing into one strain. And it's no longer, it's not, if Trump, if Trump were to be successful in installing that as a dominant narrative, I would agree with you. But in fact what we have is a deeply divided argument with respect to terrorism and foreign policy, would be my contention. Uh, Josh, and then the, young, the one behind you. So I wanted to press you a little further. I wanted to press you a little further on your concept of leadership and um, what that actually means in practice. <laughs> it means like having some effect on the world or being a unifying figure or providing a single narrative in the country. It's a little unclear because what I think about. Um, yeah, and, and also coming back to the point of whether it was not really uh, uh, a structured or unstructured uh, mm -hmm. rhetorical moment. Because you know, it seems to me that you focus on national security, but there's a tremendous concern about the economic dimensions of globalization, which features prominently in Trump's his vision for the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a hallmark <laughs> and, uh, and feature of the narrative order that underpin you know, liberal internationalism in the mm -hmm. Cold War era. And that is now a siege alongside uh, other elements of the international order. And so it seems to me that you know, uh, Trump could narrow cast and polarize. That would be leadership. But he can do that and survive and have an effect on the world. It would be leadership in, in terms of having an influence and effect on global structures. But it doesn't seem to be in consonance with your vision of leadership, which seems to speak to a broader audience. And so, uh, I, you know, if we're trying to judge leadership in terms of the ability to remake the world and uh, in image of what you want, uh, Trump or maybe Steve Bannon in control of the leaders of a new vision of economic nationalism and breaking down of both uh, the, the global interconnectedness on the economic side and some narrow vision of national protection first uh, on the security side seems to me like they can have their way and there's not much to stop them because we're in an unstructured moment and they can pitch their vision to their constituents and win elections and be damned the rest of us. Great points. Right. So if what we mean by leadership is simply the capacity to act, right, then they can act you can act effectively. Um, even over some, some period of time, certainly for four years, maybe not further, without actually engaging in leadership. But to have policy change be sustainable, right? This is where I, I do subscribe to the old John Maynard Keynes line, which is that there is always some uh, scribbler from way back who's lying behind, right? The, the battle, of, if we don't believe that the battle for ideas matters, I'm not sure what we're all doing here, right? The battle of, of ultimately the enduring uh, the enduring policy changes don't rest on ideas, then we've got a problem. The why, the, but your, your question really sort of raises a different question. Which is why, which is if there, there was this sort of dominant neoliberal world order, how is it possible that Donald Trump has succeed, and Steve Bannon have succeeded in putting forth a vision of economic nationalism that resonates with some people anyway? And I think there are, there is, uh, this is one of those elements on the neoliberal world order I think where there's always been a long-standing gap between mass and elite narratives.
right? That elites have completely bought into that world of free flows. And the ma especially on trade, the masses have been much, much more skeptical. And part of the reason for that is that the costs of trade are much more visible than the gains of trade, right? <laughs> Everybody knows somebody who down the street lost a job, right? Fell victim to free trade. The free trade produces losers, right? Produces frictional unemployment. But it is also the case that, uh, but very few people will say, as I once heard Larry Summers beautifully put it, nobody's going to say, thank God for NAFTA, because Timmy can now, I can now buy Timmy 25% more toys for Christmas. <laughs> right? The very visible costs of trade and the, ra the relatively invisible gains of trade means that there's this really big gap. Right? And so Trump is playing into a, what I think has always been a sort of a strain, a, a minority strain, but a popular strain within American political culture. Mm -hmm. We've seen that appear, appear and reappear over and over. So as much as it seems obvious, perhaps, to people in this room, the benefits of the neoliberal world order, and in fact, the idea that the United States has done well by doing good, that classic kind of liberal refrain on the liberal world order. And while some would say the United States has done peculiarly well, not by doing good, but right, it's just designed a system in which it unusually profits, Donald Trump looks out there. And, says, and he puts out a vision that is much darker, of course, right? and one that resonates with people who feel they've been left behind. Uh, yes? Hi, um, I'm Jackie. I'm a global policy student. I'm Dr. Vogel's student. I'm one of the global um, But I was going to branch off of Dr. Vogel's question and ask you about um, So in the most recent election, we saw kind of um, a rise in conspiracy theories. Mm. And just as an example, um, there was a conspiracy theory that Hillary Clinton's actually a shape-shifting reptilian. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, That's not true. And <laughs> <laughs> so going back to your statement that these narratives help place a limit on legitimate policy making, like to somebody who believes in a conspiracy <laughs> theory like that, you know, that is rational decision making for them to say we don't want Hillary as president. But I mean that's one of the more elaborate examples of a conspiracy theory. But I mean the problem is that they're not really data based, they're more data based. And they're and you know, because of that you see a rise in the popularity of people like Jones, mm -hmm. um, who uh, whose ideas in my opinion are more based on like hallucinogens than on like <laughs> actual facts. But but the the problem is that, you know, Trump I think really took advantage of that. Right. Um, so, and it's because there's no way to really fight a conspiracy theory that somebody believes in, um, what does that mean for free speech? Yeah. I mean, they, you know, as psychologists have found something even more disturbing, right? When, when let's say, you're a part of a cult movement, that predi uh, uh, an apocalyptic cult movement, and, you, and the, the date of the apocalypse comes, and then strangely, there's no apocalypse. It turns out, you would think that right, people would sort of jettison this false belief in the apocalypse. But really weirdly, they actually double down on it, <laughs> right? Because it's part of what defines their identity and the cult of which they are a part. So I should say that my con I don't have a tremendous amount to say about conspiracy theory. I have a colleague, Joanne Miller, who's done very good work on conspiracy theories. Um, because what I'm interested in, and this is a limitation of the kind of research that I'm engaged in, is, uh, you know, is elite narratives. Right? And these kinds of conspiracy theories are not usually part of sort of conventional, legitimate elite discourse. Again, when we're in this kind of strange world, as we are in right now, <laughs> when we're outside the bounds of legitimate elite discourse, um, although, you know, you almost never hear Donald Trump himself, he'll allude to these things, right? But he's always very subtle about them because that would cast him as utterly, to actually endorse them, would cast him as utterly beyond the bounds of respectability. So even there you see some of those limitations coming forward, right? Thus the dog whistle, right? Rather than the explicit invocation. Now, I don't think it's about free speech that you're really asking. I think you're really asking about deliberative democracy. How can we engage in collectively rational decision making, you seem to be asking, I think, if people are engaged in a world where we cannot have rational debate, where, where propositions are subject to argumentation. With this, I actually have to, I have to say that I'm kind of a skeptical of, there will be those who would say that any of this discussion of narratives right, is no, already suggests that we're already in a world, even if they're not conspiracy theories. The difference between a conspiracy theory and another narrative may just be the boundaries of respectability. That these things are always not subject to proof and disproof in the conventional ways that we are taught in, that we try to cultivate in our classrooms. 
that the dynamics here are already deeply politicized and deeply psychological. And so deliberative democracy envisions a, a very different world from the reality of democracy. And the scholars who study democracy, there's been a reason even before Trump is even sort of a, a glimmer in anybody's eye. There have been a series of major books that have suddenly become very, very popular, published this summer by major leading scholars of democracy, summarizing what we know about democracy, basically saying, democracy doesn't work the way we think it works. Right? Democracy is more or less an elite game, except for these brief moments, powerful moments of populism. Yes? Perhaps What's your name? Uh, Diana Bolsinger, doctoral student here at LBJ. Uh, perhaps then what we're looking at in tandem with the question of narratives you've addressed is the erosion of respect for expertise. You've talked about erosion of authority and multiple uh, multiple you know, streams, but are we losing any common measuring stick of what is democracy, what is believable, what, how do you judge an idea or a stance? I'm not sure that Americans have ever had much respect, at least in modern memory, for expertise. Don't forget that Adlai Stevenson is not elected in part because he gets tarred as an egghead in 1952 and 1956. Don't forget Ronald Reagan, right, who, you know, when he doesn't like, there you go again, troubling me with facts, right? Reagan's claims about SDI were Star Wars. Were complete, he simply wasn't interested in facts. And when people tried to pin him down on the facts, Reagan treated them as if they were kind of these, you know, niggling concerns. There's never been, I think, it, American political culture has often been deeply skeptical of expertise and has lauded the wisdom of the common man, right? Bringing that conventional, everyday wisdom. So again, within the circles, the LBJ school exists to cultivate expertise, to cultivate policy expertise. Uh, and within the, how these hallowed halls, that is what is prized. But what we were reminded of in this election, but I think is a much deeper strain in American political culture, is how much skepticism there is amongst the American body politic of expertise. And that perhaps greater wisdom <coughs> relies on the common sense wisdom of the, of the yeoman farmer of Jefferson's day. Yes? Um, Luke Snell from Cochrane School of Engineering. Um, think about the idea of narrative, so if I understand correctly, you're putting this in that context of the elites kind of dictating the narrative. And is that just a function, is that an image of the head being put on the snake? The narrative exists in all of us, uh, society. So, you know, someone like Donald Trump or any you know, other leader, they just figuring out the words to put to kind of capture that that public feeling. I guess does the narrative already exist? Then they verbalize it in a way that resonates. So, it makes it cohesive, I guess. yeah, I think that. Um, so, th as I think about these things, right, there is a kind of a, you know, there is a. Narrative is a structure out of which individuals will construct strategies of legitimation for particular policies, for instance. Um, not everything can be justified in terms of particular narratives. And when you're in these sort of unstructured moments, right, I mean, every policy argument, whether it engages in instrumental argument or normative argument, it is invoking <coughs> a particular kind of narrative, even if it isn't doing it explicitly, <coughs> giving voice to a fully fleshed out narrative. So I, I'm not sure I fully grasped your question, but that's how I think about That's a little bit how I think about this, but maybe you can elaborate now and help me. Maybe, maybe I have a different yeah. part of the vision of the narrative might be a little bit different. There's a disconnect, but um, just how much it is for me in, uh, I don't know, uh, <coughs> how much are they defining the narrative and how much of the narrative already exists and they are yeah. capturing it. All right, so that's, so that, okay, so I think I understand the question. So partly this depends upon those moments of settled narrative circumstances and unsettled narrative circumstances, right? In those moments of settled narrative circumstances, you might say that, and this is most elite debate, right? You're kind of, you narrative takers, not narrative shapers, right? You have to, you are engaged in the game of framing and fitting and res trying to resonate, create claims that will resonate in particular ways. 
there are moments of opportunity to fix things, right? Now there is, I think, an interesting debate out there, which, um, you know, which I have to confess, I, I sort of adopted a position on, but I have to confess in a weakness of the book that I can't fully prove, right? Which is, in a way, if we think about this as, you know, now that, you know, do you jump through a window that's already open, or can you actually smash a hole in the wall, right, to create that opportunity? Is Donald Trump right now smashing a hole in, you know, the wall of, of internationalism such that it will not, uh, will not prove to be resilient? Um, I have adopted the view, for the sake of, because I didn't know how to deal with it otherwise, <laughs> I adopted the view that you couldn't just smash a hole in the wall, right? This is a view that's very consistent with how, for example, scholars of social movements have fought within the social movement religion. Because otherwise we end up in this very, very, uh, sort of the world of unfalsifiable theories of brilliant speakers. Well, how do we know a brilliant speaker? Because they smashed a hole in the wall. But how do we know that they were brilliant? Because the wall, the, because we see the hole. Right? Was Martin Luther King Jr. a brilliant speaker? Sure he was, but how do you know it? Right? Nobody's really been able to persuade in this regard. But Doug McAdam has given a very persuasive account about how it is that the civil rights movement emerged such that the brilliance of King was able to capture that moment, right, in that unsettled situation. So I've adopted that view. But I have to be open to the possibility that you could, in fact, see that hole smashed open, right, in a window created where there wasn't one before, through which speakers rhetorically believe. Um, so far, I would say that the elite discourse on foreign affairs has actually proved remarkably resilient. Right? There's a reason that every one of Trump's nominees for state, for defense, for homeland security, for commerce, broke <coughs> with Donald Trump's vision. They did not give voice to Steve Bannon and economic nationalism. Right? The one exception was trade. That was the only exception on every other issue, from Russia to the role of NATO. Right? There was a lot of pushback from his own nominees, let alone from the establishment per se. Right? Many of his nominees are not really, like Rex Tillerson, not really part of the establishment. So we see that, in fact, some of these deeper underlying narratives are remarkably resilient. Will Trump succeed in eventually eroding it? I don't know. I, again, I'm basing my work on the assumption that he's not. <laughs> <laughs> right, and the assumption suggests that if we do see it's in a very exceptional moment. And we have to accept that, you know, almost none of our theories have done very well in understanding or explaining the behavior of Donald Trump. So I'm a good comment. Yes? Hi, I'm Helen LeClaire, I'm just a local resident. Uh, usually we think of the layers of policy, strategy, tactics, and it occurs, it, it seems to me that we're <coughs> going to skip policy at this point. I don't think Trump is oriented to a larger foreign policy. He's interested in individual strategies. And this comes from his experience. You know, he's dealt with many countries in the world with his projects. And, and in fact, a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times had a letter on about his 30 years of trying to do business in Russia and things like that. He's been a lot of places, he's done a lot of deals and projects, and I think he sees it as that one-to-one -one kind of thing. So my sense, I, I'm asking if, you know, what's your opinion on this? Will he be viewing this as more targeted things based upon his experience <coughs> and his opinion, and his advice, whatever, versus any grand narrative, you know? He looks for explanation or, or rationale rather than narrative. You know, I do think that sometimes we don't though, give Donald Trump enough credit. Because in the sense that I think that I, I, he's not a strategic thinker. But George Bush wasn't a strategic thinker. Um, and it's not clear to me that, I mean, Barack Obama is very thoughtful, but it's very hard to fit all this into kind of a coherent strategy, the things that the Obama administration pursued. I think it is fair to say that, at least when I look at Trump, there's actually a more consistent worldview that he has that, you know, some credit for, and that I think that you will probably see policies to the extent that he, is, he and Bannon are controlling them than others. Um, again, the, the idea that the, this goes back 30 years now, the idea that the neoliberal world order has not been in the American national interest, that America has been a giant sucker in creating these global institutions, out of which it has become the greatest power the world's ever known, but really, the United States has really gotten screwed. That's his belief. Right? And he's articulated that for a very long time. He therefore does not, and has never supported, for 30 years now, has not supported a world of free flows. And he does have, as many have put it, I think nicely, this kind of transactional conception of relationships. Right? There are not, um, not to, you know, there are no, as there are no 
friends and enemies, there are merely interests, right? And there are merely sort of short-term relationships that need to be negotiated on a bilateral basis. Now, that's a worldview, right? It may not be, whether it yields clear strategy, I don't know, but I think that there is a certain kind of coherence to that, to that view that we can begin to pick out. Now, this may be, now we know from psychologists, by the way, that we human beings are very good at seeing order where it doesn't exist. We're very good at, if the psychologists done experiments where they show people random collections of dots and people claim that there are orders when there is absolutely no order there. This is like sort of going back to Rorschach tests and so on. So perhaps Donald Trump's my Rorschach test and I'm just imposing an order on him. But I don't think so, right? And I think that this is not like Ronald Reagan where you could go back to the radio programs over 20 years and see a coherent worldview. But there are bits and pieces over the last 30, 35 years where Trump has consistently given voice to this kind of vision. Uh, and then we'll have to see the extent to which um, he, how much of it, you know, again, we know his nominees for various positions don't agree with him. We don't know what kind of decision-making processes will take place in his administration. We don't know how much influence Mattis and Kelly and, uh, and others will have compared to Jared Kushner and Steve Bannon. So there's a lot that is uncertain at this point. Uh, and maybe we'll be able to, and, and we may, and of course, to the extent that he does begin to embrace a conception of leadership, if he embraces a conception of leadership, that may presumably change his approach as well. Uh, yes? Yes, I think everything you said about the narrative, I understand, but what part did the news media, in their quest for more business and more leadership, what part did they play in that narrative? In Trump's, you mean? Or just bringing attention to Trump? Well, you know, this is, this is a great question. Um, we have, have, as scholars of the produ political communication, we have only, we sort of only scratched the surface, frankly, in some ways of understanding the media as a strategic actor. One of the dominant approaches to media is known as indexing. And it basically says the following. It basically says that government, that the media is government's <coughs> little helper as long as government is unified. So when elites are unified, when Democrats and Republicans were in the same on the same page on the Vietnam War, for instance, um, it meant that the media largely didn't ask serious questions. But only as, a, as uh, the Senate began to ask questions and so on, did that create space through which the media ran. There is a related view that also talks about the, the other thing the media likes to promote, of course, is controversy. And of course, the media gave a lot of attention to Donald Trump in part because of the outrageous things that he said. There may well be reason to think that, in fact, because Donald Trump is communicating directly, and this is purely speculative on my part, I have no data, but because Donald Trump has done something that is quite new, that is in the sense of communicating directly, essentially, with millions of people via his Twitter feed. And then counting on the media to then reproduce the Twitter feed. Right? The result may be, though, that the media feels less compelled to simply cultivate those relations with the White House and with government that have kept the media in line and have rendered it government's little helper. And so this may, par this may paradoxically, in a way, Steve Bannon's allegation last week that when he called the media repeatedly the opposition, may end up being, in a way, self-fulfilling. That is, the media, part of the way the theory of indexing works <coughs> is that you have to maintain those relations with the White House. You don't want to piss off the White House, right, because you want to be able to continue to gain access. Trump isn't as different in this regard as, say, LBJ, right? LBJ, you, fro you didn't treat LBJ well, he froze you out, whether you were a senator or you were a member of the media, right? This is hard-nosed politics. Trump isn't that different. But they wanted to cultivate those good relations. But if the, uh, if the White House is treating you as the opposition, and they're not communicating through you anyway, right, then you may as well be the opposition. And so this may, in fact, liberate the media. But that's pure speculation on my part. I have a question. Do you think society always needs a leader with a narrative? Because in real life, uh, I have a friend who gets married. He doesn't reinvent the institutional values. He's got a family, he has to work, and there's a continuum. But every time a president, the leader takes over, there's some new idea, and we always seem to want that. But what's wrong with, uh, say, Obama's uh, way of being pragmatic? He really couldn't change things, but he continued. The ship of state didn't sink, it continued forward. And so why do the bodies have to have a leader who's got a narrative? Why can't he or she say, I'm taking over, make sure there's enough work for everybody, etc.? 
Does there only have to be a world vision? Is that what, that, that's what people want? So most of us, most of the time, right? I, I spoke about, I alluded to the unreflective action of everyday life, right? We have a settled institution known as marriage, right? We work within the bonds and boundaries of that institution most of the time. And of course, the same thing is true of these deeply foundational narratives like American exceptionalism, right? Most leaders don't spend most of their time fighting it, even whether they agree with it or not, because that constitutes the sort of almost unreflective way, the practice of being a leader in American politics means that you have to have a certain fealty to American exceptionalism. This, in fact, doesn't even need to be articulated. Nobody needs to be taught it. It's the riding a bicycle of being a politician in America, right? Everybody knows how to do it, and they learn how to do it on a daily basis. <laughs> but you, I think, speaker, are speaking very powerfully in ways that I really, that really resonate with me about our expectations of leadership. I do think that we should demand of leaders, we should always demand of leaders um, justification or legitimation. Right? Otherwise, they're just sort of acting very willingly in ways that we can't hold them accountable. And we don't know why they're doing what they're doing, but we should require them to have publicly acceptable reasons for things. But I think your question is, why do those publicly acceptable reasons have to be rooted in some kind of grand strategic vision? So in fact, this project and others, um, part of what I've been spending some time doing, I've been trying to reclaim, in a way, um, the virtues of pragmatism. As I said at the very end of the talk, I think we need to adjust our conceptions of leadership in ways that are both mere realistic, but also may in fact be better. Because as I think um, Eugene Goltz was suggesting earlier, there are real costs to having dominant narratives. And that cost becomes one of rigidity. But that's true of grand strategy too, right? Grand strategy's great benefit is also its great weakness. That is, grand strategy is supposed to provide a compass that keeps the ship of state even as buffeted by the storms of global politics, more or less keeps that ship of state headed in the right direction, right? Stra grand strategy is its north star. But the problem with grand strategy is it tends to become rigid. You tend to try to fit everything into the terms of that the narrative in that, of which that strategy is constitutive, right? And so that itself can be quite destructive. Uh, and so I think there's a lot to be said. I would say that there's a lot to be said. The challenge of pragmatism is what are the limits that, that imposes? How does thinking pragmatically prevent it from simply lurching from crisis to crisis? And simply not, simply the ship of state is no longer heading, forget, you know, it's, it's just simply going wherever the moment takes you, right? What in principle strategy is supposed to, to provide that set of costs and benefits? So I have to confess, um, I actually spent a lot of this past summer reading the philosophical literature on pragmatism, which turned out to be not nearly as helpful as I was hoping that it was going to be. Um, Mostly because John Dewey is utterly incomprehensible. Uh, uh, I don't remember it offhand. I'm going to butcher it, but you can. Oliver Wendell Holmes had the most absolutely brilliant takedown of John Dewey that I've ever read. He said something along the lines of that it would be reading John Dewey is a little bit like um, hearing the voice of God. If God were really very confident that you should be listening to him, but is utterly incomprehensible. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that, there, that I think that's an important intellectual agenda, which I confess I haven't completely worked out. But I think that we have often overestimated the value of strategy and haven't paid enough attention to its drawbacks. Sir? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but earlier What, your on, name? Uh, Shan. Shan Ding. Um, earlier on, you, in one of your answers, you, uh, you mentioned about how there's this culture of not trusting the professionals or some, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. And I was hoping if... Uh, Skepticism of expertise and so on. Yeah. But I was hoping if you could elaborate on that a bit more because I don't know if that's exactly true. Because whenever you look at, you know, whenever you see students learn stuff like practical science, like physics, for example, you see a lot of incoming students walk in with a lot of misconceptions of just how the world fundamentally works. Whenever you show them how it works and you show them and you show them like exactly the equations, the history, the practicality of how everything works, there's not a doubt in their mind they jump right into you know, a different kind of mindset of how acceleration works, how kinematics works. But when it comes to social sciences, um, in business we, we call this like a moving cost, right? There's more, like whenever you try to have someone hop over to like a new technology or a new mode of, of anything, you have to account for more than just uh, like a technological or whatever improvement, you also have to account for some kind of, because sometimes there are moving costs. When in practical sciences, there aren't that much 
and that people have invested within you know their knowledge but whenever it comes into like social science with like political beliefs you have you know their social sphere of like parents and friends mm -hmm. that they could be sacrificing if they jump if they jump the wagon of what they believe in mm -hmm. and so i was wondering if that might account for it's not exactly the lack of faith in professionalism as much as it is as much as it is just the failure to account for that kind of uh social repulsion there. Yeah, so sometimes literature refers to what you're calling transaction costs, right? Um, I don't know that that's in fact true. I mean, there's a long tradition about in the history of science about the difficulty involved in actually changing people's beliefs about how the world works. Right? So Thomas Kuhn has a very famous book on the structure of scientific revolutions that precisely documents how resistant people with beliefs are to evidence. And in fact, in some ways, Experts, as the social psychologist Phil Tetlock has found, experts are in fact very, very resistant to changing their beliefs. And for example, um, as he showed in some previous work, actually got the end of the Cold War wrong and were more resistant to changing their beliefs about the Soviet Union uh, than were others. For two reasons. One, because they have extremely well settled beliefs that in fact professional networks are involved in. This is true of scientists as well, <coughs> that we're dealing with large scale scientific changes. But secondly, also, tend to also be individuals that psychologists would characterize as having high cognitive <coughs> complexity, which really means that they're sort of basically super good at explaining away discrepant evidence, right? That's at odds with their existing beliefs. So on the one hand, you know, I, what you say is very, very attractive. But even in the sciences, this is not nearly as straightforward as I think that, uh, Shan, you're laying it out. I think it's actually much more complicated. Um, and this is, I think you raise a good point about why it is that people might be resistant to changing their beliefs. I would just point out that the current administration is also not merely anti-social science, but anti-science. And is not interested merely in devaluing expertise in the social sciences, but which is to devalue it in the hard sciences, and which is to deval and devalues expertise in the military sciences. Um, presumably, people saw the ways in which they have um, altered the membership of the national Security Council, but particularly the Principles Committee of the National Security Council. Some of the reportage, if you look at the order carefully, didn't get this exactly right. It wasn't that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the director of national intelligence are going to be members of the National Security Council, but they are not going to be members of the Principles Committee of the National Security Council, but Steve Bannon is a member, the chief strategist is a member of the Principles Committee. So that is, if there's any sign of sort of the, de I think this is a general view of this administration which fits with its populist worldview which is the general devaluation of all forms of expertise. And Sean Spicer's willingness yesterday to say that State Department employee, 100 State Department employees who want to, in the usual calm ways of the State Department, sign a dissenting cable. It's not like people haven't done it before. Right? It's a way, in fact, bureaucratically to let off steam. It's a smart thing to have an outlet for dissent. Um, he says, basically, he's not worried about their departure. Go. Right? They're not interested in cultivating expertise. And so, it is a general view that a, a government of generalists without decades of expertise can work as well as a government uh, with experts. Yes, again. If I may just follow up. D Diana, yes. Diana, yes. If I may just follow up <coughs> on the follow ups and respond to your response. I 100% agree with you, sir, that there is always been skepticism towards expertise especially in terms of populist movements. That's almost by definition what's driving a populist movement. What I'm fascinated by is I do see, it's almost like it's being put on steroids with the uh, creation, of multiplication of Decline of any kind of expertise for authority. I'm old enough to remember that it was a thing in commercials. Trust me, I'm a doctor, you want XYZ. And now you've got the anti vaxxers movement, for example, that is totally denigrating doctors as uh, now corrupt. No, I mean, this is what I said about Daniel Rogers in the Age of Fracture, right? This is sort of at the heart of what I'm talking about is the decline of authority. And the skepticism of expertise that we've been talking about is part and parcel of that decline of authority. Right? So I think you're right in the sense that it's definitely, uh, and it's gotten worse. 
I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I think let's just say it's uh, it's going, and uh, let's hope let's uh, let, let's hope that it reaches an end sooner rather than rather than later, maybe in four years. Uh, yes. Uh, to bring it to a slightly more happy topic, uh, <laughs> uh, nuclear weapons. <laughs> um, in, as you say, like, you know, in striving, like, in the current prison, um, like, striving to, like, either, like, imbibe the narrative that the constituency that elected him brought, or, like, bringing out his own narrative or both, what, what are the risks or additional risks in, in terms of, like, we have nuclear powers around the world, and, like, by him, what seems to me, I mean, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm Shazad, I'm from the Crockdale School, so not, I have, like, you guys know much more than I do, and, like, what, what is the perspective in terms of like risk of nuclear proliferation or, or nuclear war at, at worst, you know, in his decision making process? Um, an excellent question to which, I, to which I wish I knew the answer. Uh, what can I say? We know that President Trump, a candidate Trump and then President Trump has alluded to the fact that it wouldn't be such a terrible thing if nuclear weapons proliferated. Um, there are certain very distinguished deceased political scientists who would agree with him, right, when it comes to nuclear weapons, as Ken Waltz famously wrote, more may be better. Uh, I suspect that, in fact, the dominant strain of U.S. foreign policy, and again, I find it hard to imagine, the myth, look, we know that president, let me take a step back, presidents um, cannot do everything, right, uh, and so presidents can issue broad instructions, but unless something rises to the top of the national agenda and is something they really deeply care about, the bureaucracy will continue to do what the bureaucracy has always done. And I don't imagine at the end of the day that nuclear weapons are very high on Donald Trump's agenda. That's not my sense. He had a few offhand comments at points in the campaign. This is not a focus of Donald Trump's campaign. It's not the focus of his populist agenda. Uh, and so I would imagine that, broadly speaking, the U.S. has never uh, has worked very hard to prevent proliferation. The U.S. government has never really believed in the logic of nuclear deterrence. It really believes in the logic of strategic superiority. And I would expect that that will probably continue in the sense that those who will continue to shape U.S. nuclear policy moving forward will presumably be the bureaucracy because Donald Trump, that doesn't seem to be his focus. But do I really know that? Of course not. So thanks everyone for a great conversation with you.